And greetings everyone, I'm Mark. Once again, this is my opinion. As you can tell from the title up there, it's time for another review. This time it's of the latest entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And marks one of the titular characters' entries into said universe after years of speculation since the original studio that made the previous two films got bought out and was... Is that right word for that? I don't want to say dissolved since it technically still exists as a separate studio within the structure, but absorbed. There it is. It was assimilated into the bigger Disney Marvel family. That, of course, is the Deadpool. This, of course, is Deadpool and Wolverine. Now, I'm going to be honest. I've never been a fan of Deadpool, as, or should I say, haven't been a fan of Deadpool as long as many of you have. I don't think I should say never. I mean, I knew kind of all the character a little bit in the background. Some of the stuff people always say about him. Ah, he's, a, he's just a straight-up copy parody of Slade Wilson, Deathstroke from DC, and other stuff like that. You know, yada yada. And a lot of the over-the-top stuff like, oh, and then of course, the more recent stuff. Ah, they just made him a copy of Harley Quinn. Oh, they just made Harley Quinn a copy of him. But even with that, when they made the video game a couple years ago, it's actually a decade now that I think about it. It's like, wow time goes. I played it and I enjoyed it. I do have a copy on the PS4 I haven't played so I haven't replayed it in a while so maybe in a little bit maybe I actually might get around to it once I finish playing a couple new games that I've been meaning to finish. Now even with all that when the teaser was leaked for the original film I watched it and I thought oh this should be interesting. Because I know I'm skipping around and everything, because the thing that technically introduced me to Deadpool was his disastrous appearance in X-Men Origins Wolverine. I will still say the part where it actually is Ron Reynolds playing him, he actually does do a pretty decent job for what little bit of the characters in there. It's the latter half where, like, yeah, I understand why the hardcore fans hate that. Now, when they did announce they were making the original film, I was hyped. Me and Jeff went and saw it, and I really did enjoy the film. Nice way to spend the beginning of my weekend that week to see that film. And of course, when they announced they were making the sequel a couple years later, I had to go see it, and I definitely enjoyed it. I haven't watched both films back-to-back -back in a while, but I remember liking the second one a little bit more. But I think part of that might be the higher budget and all that, but it's one of those things I'll see how it looks back-to-back. -back. Now, with the buyout, I was in the camp of, like, I would really like to see a third one, but if they never make one, no skin off my nose, it's just going to be sad. But then when they announced they were going to make a third one and it was going to be R, I'm like, okay then, that should be good. If they let it be R and don't interfere with it too, too much, it should be good. Then, of course, when they announced that Hugh Jackman was coming out of character retirement to once again play Wolverine, I'm like, oh, that could be interesting. Because you know they're going to try to do it in a way that definitely pays a little respect to what happened to him at the end of Logan and allow everything to go well. Especially since the MCU has been going in the direction of multiverse for a while, the variants and all that. There is a story reason why there could be another Wolverine, especially considering that the X-Men series already delved into time travel and all that. And you could look at it and go like, okay, then Logan, is they've already mentioned, is in an alternate future, so this could either be... This could either be the main one we saw in the original films, this could be one from the result of the time travel, everything's all weird, or it could just be a completely separate one that's splintered off because of the time travel. Now, if you take the flashback we see later in the film seriously, then it's a little bit of that, but this is technically the same Wolverine we saw in X-Men Origins Wolverine, which, if that's the case, this is a nice little way to redeem that version of the character. The only reason I say that is because we actually see the flashback scenes of him getting the adamantium and all that. It could be stand-in stuff, but they could have used the little brief flashbacks from X2, or they could have just done other implication stuff, but nope, that's the one they went with. Now, film came out. I was watching a little bit of the marketing, and I'm glad I saw the film when I did, because the spoilers are all over the TikTok, and it's like I can't even scroll down five seconds on this thing without another little scene coming up. Thankfully, it's mainly the moments that don't really provide a lot of spoilers, like the opening credits and other stuff, and a lot of people are respectful, and 
like posting little thing although there's a spoiler warning which just as a heads up deeper into this video I am gonna start talking spoilers I will give the warning like I used to do with some of the MCU film reviews about it now of course I saw the film and I have to say I did enjoy it now where I rank it I don't know I'd have to watch all three in quick succession which I'm thinking since I do plan on seeing this film in theaters again that I'll watch the other two first and then watch it and then do a little ranking of it but I'll say that this knowing what we got in the original trailer where the MCU has gone since Endgame and how Deadpool is a character and what we got in the, his first two films this is everything I could have hoped for in this sequel it is still respectful to Logan's thing for all of two seconds because <laughs> you know Deadpool is as a character he's gonna go there and Hugh Jackman he really does not pull any punches as Wolverine here he really both him and Ryan Reynolds make use of that R rating well and there's a lot of blood in there I mean it's not a lot of practical blood like back in the day but there's still a lot of good blood use at points now the plot of the film is that while Wade is still alive following the events of the second film things have not been going the best for him because of his whole time travel thing he did manage to find out a way to cross into other universes he went from his universe which is Earth 10005 to Earth 616 which I know a lot of people are going to go it's not 616 in the MCU continuity of events, technically it is. It only has that different des designation when you look at it in the whole greater Marvel continuity with the comics and all that. But within the consigns of the films, that's what it is. Especially since that's usually looked at as the main one. And according to the MCU, this is the main one. But It's really a nitpicky thing to argue about. But the sacred timeline, is that better? where he applied to join the Avengers and he was talking with Happy Hogan and knowing those two characters the conversation goes exactly the way you would expect it to go but ever since that meeting Wade's life has gone downhill him and Vanessa their relationship didn't work out which is kinda sad considering that was part of his motivation in the previous film but stick with me it does get better by the end that's all I'm saying about it in the this part of it now it's his birthday, like we see in the trailer, all the people he cares about, who he saved at the previous film. They're all there. But then he gets a knock at the door, and who is it? It is the Time Variance Authority, the TVA. And by the end, we find out this is the TVA as they were at the end of Loki, Loki Season 2. If you haven't seen Loki Season 2, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil the ending right here, but Loki does kind of fix the whole thing with the TVA by becoming essentially the one watching the world tree which is how all the different timelines and all that are coexisting and all that he doesn't make an appearance here though but his version of the TVA does now Mr. Paradox is the one who sent the TVA guys to get him in Deadpool does exactly the type of comments to these guys with their weapons out that you would expect him to and this is the first part time where we see oh yeah this is going to be an R rated film now, Mr. Paradox brings him in there that, yeah, we, my higher-ups would like you to come to this universe and all that. You get to be everything. They give him a brand new suit, including adamantium katanas. Now, part of the reason for this, he soon finds out, is due to the fact that his universe is about to disintegrate. Partially due to the fact that because of Logan dying at the end of Logan, his timeline is destabilizing because Logan was an anchor being. Now... My scratching head comment with this is, okay, I don't mind Logan being an anchor being and all that, and then this whole thing going with this. And, of course, you can look at this as being a little meta, considering that Hugh Jackman was, quote-unquote, retired from the role. But if it's supposed to be the Logan from Logan, are we trying to say that Deadpool is in continuity with that one? Even though we saw in the second one the X-Men from the prequel films. So it's just one of those things that show that a lot of the timeline stuff and with the Marvel X-Men films doesn't really make a lot of sense. Even though years ago I did do a film video entitled something about the continuity of the 
X-Men live action films and I believe that was before Apocalypse came out so I think the newest one there was I actually that was before Days of Future Past came out so so a couple more films after that and made this whole thing thing and that's why Deadpool in the first film said these timelines are so confusing it's just so scratchy head to think about it. it's like how can that be it's like all the times don't really match up especially if Logan is supposed to be its own separate universe but I guess you could look at it as like they split off but they're still like that little bit of lingering things with Fox and all that. But I think it's more just supposed to be a meta thing. And now that their golden boy is no longer there, the, their cinematic universe went right into the number. Now, Wade decides, you know what, screw this. I'm not going to let my universe die. So he steals Paradox's t pad that he has, and he goes to try to find a variant of Logan. First, he's going to show that, yeah, Logan can't die. Healing factor, bitch. He goes in, he finds Logan from the end of the previous film. And remember the thing I mentioned a little bit ago about uh, for all the two seconds? This is it. Because he digs up Logan's grave, and all we got is an adamantium skeleton with some like skin attachments left. And this leads to an excellent opening credit scene sent to Bye 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 by InSync, where fighting agents of the TVA. Deadpool uses Wolverine's dead body. All the bones and all that. And yes, he does in the end do what you think he's going to do with those bones. And it is glorious. Uh, I'll say this. I mean, I really. The MCU films I've seen in theaters, I mainly seen like the big ones like the Doctor Strange sequel, the Thor sequel, and all that. I did enjoy them to various degrees, even though I haven't done reviews of them. I have to say that this. Is definitely my favorite of the MCU films since the last two Avengers ones and I laughed a lot longer and a lot harder about the jokes in this films I can't remember the last time an MCU one made me laugh this hard with certain moments like, it's like that's how much it got to be some of this some of this humor here and of course as you would expect he has to travel the multiverse to find a variant of Wolverine. He finds the one in the suit and through some more shenanigans they end up in the void which if you have not seen Loki season 1 or season 2 is where Elioth and basically all the trash that the TVA destroys goes. And of course there they find characters from the other Fox Marvel films. That's where they see Sabretooth so see, they see Toad and of course Cassandra Nova who is Charles Xavier's true twin sister who is pruned from existence by the TVA. And uh, she basically manages to survive there because she kind of has a weird deal with the TVA and plus Elias she'll feed stuff to. Now their whole thing is they're going to try to get out of there and go with all of Wade's plan. And that's all the plot I'm really going to talk about in this part of it. I'll get some more in a little bit. All in all, the acting by the characters are pretty good. Like I mentioned, Hugh and Ryan don't pull any punches with their characters and they do have a pretty good chemistry. And you can definitely tell that they're bouncing off each other pretty well. And not even two minutes into knowing each other, the way he plays it, you can tell that this version of the Wolverine is tired of Wade shit. And that just continues on and on throughout the film. Now there's a point later on where he does get a grudging respect for him. And this does turn into a friendship in the way that Hugh and Ryan play off each other. Now, more than likely, this is probably the last time we see Hugh as Wolverine. Even though there are occasional jokes all throughout it, you know, Ryan has Wade breaking the fourth wall. It's like, yeah, they're going to keep making him do this till he's 90. I, I don't think it'll go that long, but I will say, if they do manage to get Hugh out of retirement to play a character at least one more time after this, alongside Ryan as Wade, those two together, they do, do good. Whether it's just like a quick cameo or whatnot, we don't know. Uh, the score by... Rob Simonson. He does a decent job with the score. Uh, the directing is done by Sean Levy, which if you don't know that name, he's the guy that directed Big Fat Liar, Cheaper by the Dozen, the remake of the Pink Panther, the Night at the Museum trilogy, Real Steel, Date Night. The uh, last film he did was The Adam Project, which had uh, Ryan and he also did Free Guy. So 
if you're not really the biggest fan of some of Ryan's most recent ones, you might be a little iffy there, but I'll say he does work pretty well here, considering that uh, it's more off of this all type of humor. I haven't seen the other one, so I don't know how well he works there. The budget's about $200 million, which I think is like on the mid-range for one of these films. Definitely higher than the first one, and I believe higher than the second one. And so far, according to Wikipedia, it's already made 438.3, and that's the opening weekend. And of course, going off of Hollywood accounting, that would mean it's technically only broken even. Because you remember the whole thing that I mentioned time and again, that according to Hollywood accounting, you got to make double your budget to break even. Of course, when you're counting like how much marketing and all that, you can imagine that. But I wouldn't be surprised if at least a couple many of that was from all those uh, popcorn buckets they're selling. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money from the movie is made. And then, of course, the use of music, which I got to bring this up because if there's one thing I really love in music, in movies, is when they use like non score music to good effect. It's one of those things I don't think I've mentioned in the video yet, but I really do miss those music ins from and inspired by the film soundtracks and of course soundtracks that have a lot of the films that are used in here and this is no extension I've already talked about Bye 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 by NSYNC perfect way to open the film uh, let's see you got Iris from the Goo Goo Dolls at one point of course you got Power of Love which that film the perfect way to underscore Wade trying to find the right Wolverine because you know it's from about time travel and those series do kind of they go in a whole multiverse thing without it technically being a multiverse because it's technically one interchangeable timeline. I'm not going to delve into the whole thing about time travel and all that here, but it's a perfect use of that song. <laughs> I'm a rambling man by Will and Jennings at one point. Uh, Lady in Red. Uh, there, there's I'm With You by Avril Lavigne, but I don't recall that. For We hear a few bars of The Greatest Show <laughs> from The Greatest Show. Man. Hugh Jackman, you knew they were going to throw that in there. Uh, I'll be seeing you. Uh, let's see. Alrighty. Uh, and of course, there's that one Madonna song that no one has ever gotten a license with. I'm looking for it on the list here, but I'm not seeing it. But the use of that, that was an excellent use of it. And then, of course, this is technically not a movie spoiler. I mean, out of context, it's not. But in context, it will be. The use of Good Riddance, Time of Your Life by Green Day. I know the song is about a, about a baddish breakup, but this, the tone of this music and then some of the lyrics and all that, it is the perfect song to underscore the mid credit scene, which was a loving, heartfelt tribute to the Fox Marvel films, whether you like a lot of them or hate a lot of them. And this is not just the X-Men ones, Fantastic Four and all that one. It's the perfect way to undercut that. Undercut that, excuse me. And it really did hit me here like, wow. Yeah, right there. But it just shows that I'm not just crapping all over it. They really are being heartfelt with this film. Because that's one thing I will say. This film... There's a lot of humor in it, but it definitely still does have a lot of heart with it. And considering that you have Wolverine in here, it kind of has to go that way. Now, that's going to be all the non-spoiler part of it. If you don't want to be spoiled by anything big, I would stop the video right here. Because from here on, the stuff I have to talk about with this film is going to be spoiler-ish. So if you haven't seen the film and you want to wait until you see the film to continue on, you save the video and then come back. If you don't care about spoilers. Now, on to the spoilers. Now, when Wade is jumping back and forth, grabbing all the different Wolverines, I love how a lot of this is tribute to all the different things throughout the comics. Like, of course, first we get comic accurate, accurate Wolverine. When them using CGI to make Hugh Jackman Wolverine's height of 5'3". And the way they do it shows that while that concept works in the comics, 
Unless you get an actor who could pull up that same menace who is 5-3, which I'm sure is possible. It doesn't hit the same. And of course, with Hugh Jackman, it just adds to the humor of it. And of course, the way it goes the usual route. Of course, you get the one Wolverine with the eye patch and the white suit. There's an actual old man Logan at one point. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, that is cool. And of course, that's the one with the shotgun. We get that one Alpha Omega one in the alleyway, which is the one that really beats the crap out of way. <laughs> the power of love. You gotta love that. And of course, the one being crucified on the giant X, which is like, ooh. And of course, this is where we get one of the cameos. We get a cameo from Henry Cavill as a Wolverine variant. Because this is one of the things where they do touch on that. Because in the previous shows and movies where we've had variants of the characters, they've gone back and forth on whether or not they look like all look the same or they're different. For Doctor Strange, they were going with they look the same. But then again, we only saw a couple universes. I know some people have a thing with that multiverse and madness, my butt. It's like, hey, doesn't mean they're going to see a lot of multiverses. And we see at least four variants of Doctor Strange, and then they're all played by Cumberbatch. I've seen an alternate version of Charles, but still played by him. Uh, hmm. It's a couple of Wanda's. It's still same Wanda. But then in Loki, we have a couple that are played by Tom. Of course, the female one's obviously not going to be Tom. Then we got other ones that are not Tom one because it's older. So that one you could think maybe looked like Tom when he was younger by Asgardian standards. But it also be he didn't look like Tom. The kid one, obviously, too young, so it's hard to tell if he's going to look like Tom or not. Uh, the one that has the hammer, obviously, not doesn't look like Tom. Uh, Alligator Loki, obviously, doesn't look like Tom. So they go back and forth. It's going to depend on the universe. I mean, and of course, in Cross the Spider-Verse, all the different ones, they don't look alike. So it's going to vary on the universe. Here, we get a little bit of that. Some of them are going to look similar, some of them are not. And that doesn't... And that also holds to rule for Deadpool because we do have the Deadpool core in here. Some of them, you could probably make the argument, some of them probably look like how Wade does, other than uh, the one that is very nice with nice hair. When it comes to the Logans, the Cavill, Cavill one is the only one that doesn't look like him. And, but Henry Cavill looks good as Wolverine there, but for the joke, <laughs> it's perfect. Then, of course, he finds the one that he takes, and he's the one in the comic accurate suit. Well, I mean,. One of the comic accurate suits, because we get the other one when we get a little tease of him fighting Hulk. <laughs> that was a nice little thing there. Now, a lot of the fights in the void, some of it is what you would expect. Some of it, you know, they're just in there with a joke. Like the quick fight between Logan and Sabretooth. I kind of expected that. I thought it was going to last a little bit longer, but with all the characters that are there, it makes sense. Uh, what happens with Toad later on makes sense. Cassandra, how she uses her powers all throughout it, just the way they show it, it makes sense. I don't really know a whole lot about her character, but just from what the presenting and what the tone of the film, it makes sense, especially with Wade commenting on it with her fingers and all that. Without me saying stuff, take that what you will. And like I mentioned earlier with the loving tribute, that even goes down to what other Marvel characters we see. We don't just see the villains. We see some heroes too. Because it brings back Elektra from the 05 film. It brings back Wesley Snipes' Blade. And of course one we never got a chance to see because they canceled it. We actually finally get to see Chan and Tatum as Gambit. Cajun accent and all. Which, not really being around Cajun people, I can't say how good it is, but it does, it's a nice little touch to add to humor. And of course, you also get X-23 back, played by the same actress from Logan. Now this one, the way things go, it looks like it's a variant, but it also sounds like it could be from the same universe. It's like, it's one of those weird little things like, eh. I would assume it's the same universe, but then it makes me wonder, why the hell is she there? Did the TVA prune her as well because of something was going to happen? They never comment on it. 
could also be from a similar universe but different and she got pruned there for some weird reason they, they never comment on it other than she's there so i guess you could say she's only there for fan service but technically all the cameo actors are there for fan service so if we're really going to nitpick it there we got to go the whole way but the ones that survive it, it makes sense for their inclusion there and a lot of the dialogue there there's some in jokes thing there and uh, probably one of my favorite was uh, Blade's little line about him being the only Blade. That comes up uh, when they mention the rock launcher was from the Punisher, and they're like, "Which one?" There's been like five of them. I was like, "That would have been cool seeing like one of the other Punishers." Even though I haven't seen the film, all oh, honestly, it would have been fun to see Lundgren back as the Punisher in the cameo. But well, that's not to be. And it's nice to see that these characters, they go out fighting, because in the final fight against all of uh, Cassandra's thugs, it's a nice little moment there. Now, of course, the final fight does involve the TVA's plans, because their whole thing is that they're not going to just let the universe die on its own, because without Logan being in there, the universe is going to slowly disintegrate, but it's going to take thousands of years. It's going to be one of those things where the universe just continues, continues, and... Off in existence. Which, when you think about it, it's a nice little comment on uh, comic continuity. That the, the timeline just keep going and going, and then just suddenly <laughs> stops. Like, they'll just stop printing comics on one continuity eventually, or just be like, okay, this goes in another one. Then again, more an event thing would probably comment on that, but it could be, like, for various reasons. Now, they were going to set up this bomb... It would completely annihilate it. It's using a matter and antimatter. But Cassandra tries to interfere and use the bomb for her own plan, which would involve destroying more than just that universe. She'd be going to destroy other universes and make it to where only the Void is left. Now, of course, our Deadpool and Logan are not going to have that. And they go when they actually stop, stop it successfully. And the way they do it, this is where I say the heart of the film and shows that their relationship has developed from like them being at odds with each other. They fight each other in a, inside a freaking Honda Odyssey at one point once Logan finds out that Deadpool's not been 100% truthful with him. <clears throat> but after that, they keep you know having each other's back and grudging respect to beginnings of a friendship here where they're trying to decide who's going to do it. And it looks like together they could do it and survive. And that's all I'm going to say about it here. Because even though this is the spoiler section, I want to keep some of it. But the way this scene is shot and framed, pure cinema. I mean, there's some humor in there, like with Deadpool. It, but yeah, it's, it's excellent. And of course, this follows probably one of my favorite fight scenes in the whole film. And that is Logan and Deadpool versus the Deadpool core. This is where we get all the different variants of Deadpool you can imagine. We get Nice Pool, which is the only one of him that does not have the bad face, but also does not have the healing factor. We, of course, get dog pool. We get head pool. We get kid pool. We get baby pool. We get lady dead pool, played by Ryan Reynolds' current wife. And the funny thing is, kid pool is also played by one of his kids. You get cowboy dead pool. You get a samurai dead pool. You get, like, a 1800s English-looking dead pool. <laughs> There's so many variants of it. It's like... Dead, the diff, all these Deadpools, they got all the DLC. And the fight, I just love it because it's a long take. And you know I love long takes. And just the way the cameras pan inside the bus and all that. Now, of course, these Deadpools have healing factors. So you know it's not going to keep them down. Which leads to a nice little fun moment. But it's an excellent fight scene. Especially since this is the first scene in the film where Logan actually dons his helmet. So that sort of thing makes it. Then, of course, another little commentary on the superhero landing. It was like, this film was really made with love for the fans. That's really all I could say. Now, it doesn't look like Disney really anchored them too much. Apparently, there was only one thing Feige said no on, and that was no cocaine use in the film, which I get it. We know it's going to be R. They don't want that type of thing. But that was good fodder for a joke between Deadpool and Blind Al when they're talking about it. And they're like, no, no, they know all the slang. <laughs> they go back and forth with all the slang. It's a fun little moment there. And the way the film ends, like I said, if this is the last time we see Hugh as Wolverine in live action, this is the perfect way for him to walk off into the sunset. 
It does end a little bit with Wade and Vanessa getting back together. It's a little hint there. And other than the fact that Logan's there and Wade's buddy now, the status quo from the beginning of the film is reset. So, you know, other than the fact they know about the wider universe. And there's going to be the possibility of Deadpool interjecting himself in Secret Wars and other future MCU things. How? We don't know. But hopefully... If they do it, even though it's going to be PG-13, they at least will allow Deadpool to have a little bit of his personality there. I mean, even if they let him curse and just bleep it out or have other weird sounds or him get upset because he can't use the one fuck of four a PG-13 films allowed. We'll go from there. Uh, there's not really much else to talk about with this film. I mean, shots feel pretty good. I mean, the CGI... Compared to some of the previous MCU films, it definitely seems like they took their time with this, especially since they had the strike all last year that they stopped filming for. And definitely if you've been looking to see Wolverine and Deadpool in a film together, this will not disappoint you. Uh, if you haven't really been a big fan of the Deadpool films or haven't really liked Reynolds' recent films, you might have a little bit, but that's going to really depend on your personal thing. Me, it is what I wanted out of this type of crossover film between these two, and... Like I said, the whole thing at the end with uh, the loving and a little tribute to that. Oh, and by the way, we do see a certain Marvel actor in this film. He does not play the character you would expect. And the whole joke involving him does tie into the end credit sequence. And I had a feeling that it was going to go the way it was going to go the moment it showed up. That's all I'm going to say about it because I want there at least be one surprise for y'all. But... You probably already know who it is, just by me being my loosey-goosey thing, but I'm not going to say it. All in all, enjoyed the film. Definitely going to see it again in theaters. Once it hits home video, definitely going to be in my collection somewhere. And uh, that's really all I have to say about that. So, till next time, everybody.